Biodiversity conservation is a complex process that involves several steps. The first step is to prioritize the species on which to focus conservation efforts. The next step is to inventory and monitor the target species to track its distribution and abundance. The third and final step is to manage the species to build up populations, mostly through landscape and habitat management approaches. These research efforts can be combined with government legislation to form endangered species programs. Let's go through this process and take a closer look at some examples of insect conservation. The first step in many insect conservation activities is to prioritize which species to conserve. The purpose of this step is to set goals that promote protection of the target species and to promote future biodiversity overall. Identification of a conservation target allows effective design of conservation actions at both global and local scales. Prioritization is often established based on the concept of irreplaceability. Irreplaceability is a measure of the conservation value of a specific target and can be used to determine priorities for action when resources are limited. Measures of irreplaceability can be applied across multiple aspects of conservation, but here we focus on only two applications. The first application of irreplaceability emphasizes conservation efforts in geographical regions most likely to be severely impacted by climate and landscape changes. These include biodiversity hotspots, regions in the world where the biodiversity per unit area is very high. The logic to this is that more biodiversity will be eradicated if hotspots are impacted by human activity than other regions. However, this approach does not emphasize unique or rare species that may not be present in the identified regions, which are therefore not covered under the protective conservation umbrella. Most documented species at risk are from temperate regions, so prioritization tactics to conserve threatened species can be unbalanced. Many temperate countries like the United States, Japan, and much of Western Europe practice extensive conservation efforts. This creates a misleading impression that endangered insect species are found primarily in temperate regions of the world, simply because more research has been done there. In reality, most endangered species are in the tropics, simply because of the higher biodiversity in those areas. Irreplaceability can also be applied at the species level of target organisms. On the whole, irreplaceability is higher for rare species with limited geographic distribution compared to common species with greater geographic distribution. If there are healthy populations of the same species outside the conservation area, a population under consideration for conservation becomes more replaceable. It is important to remember that measures of irreplaceability at the species level account for taxonomic uniqueness, global rarity of the species in question, and unique phenomena. A great example of this is monarch butterfly conservation. Recall in an earlier module, we discussed monarch butterflies as an important symbol of insect conservation, even though they are not in global decline. Monarch conservation efforts focus on saving the diminishing populations of migratory monarch butterflies, rather than the species overall. This impressive migration is an unusual phenomenon that is unrivaled by anything else in nature. Because monarch migration spans all of North America, these populations may provide information about the ecological health of North American habitats, and the outlook is a bit grim. In California in the 1980s, surveys estimated anywhere between 5 to 10 million monarchs overwintered each year. These surveys are ongoing, with a recent survey in 2018 estimating as few as 30,000 individuals overwintered across California. Fortunately, government authorities are taking action to conserve migratory monarch populations. In the U.S., stands of trees are being planted around their overwintering grounds to protect against harsh weather, along with native nectar plants to provide the insects with an accessible food source. 
There is a common misconception that many insects can't be at risk because their presence is noticeable in an ecosystem. A high population density of an insect species does not mean that they are safe from extinction. Take, for example, the case of the Rocky Mountain locust. Prior to the 1880s, this locust species was so abundant in Western Canada and the USA that when they swarmed, they formed a great white glistening cloud that blocked out the sun for as long as six hours. Yet, for a supposedly abundant species, all traces of the Rocky Mountain locust suddenly and quietly vanished in the early 1900s. The exact cause for the extinction of the Rocky Mountain locust is unknown. Although farmers made active attempts to eradicate the species, some suggest that landscape change through agriculture development may have been the primary driver. Even ubiquitous species can be impacted by the effects of human activities. It is important to track insect populations to prevent more species from following the path of the Rocky Mountain locust. There are many tools and methods that we can use to track populations of insects. Knowledge of a species location allows conservation managers to associate species status with environmental features. After the target insect species for conservation is identified, the next step is to inventory at-risk populations. This involves detailed mapping and quantification of populations of the species in question. It can be more difficult to quantify endangered insect populations than endangered vertebrates like tigers or pandas. This is because insects are small and may be overlooked in biodiversity surveys. As a result, the population density of many species over space and time is not well documented. Once the species distribution is understood, the next step is to measure responses of insect populations to natural and human-driven disturbances over time. The measurement of such temporal changes in population abundance and distribution is known as monitoring. Results from monitoring efforts tell us if the population changes over time, and extrapolation from this data can be used to make predictions about the future of the population. Monitoring is a fundamental cornerstone of biodiversity conservation. Inventory and monitoring can be achieved with a variety of methods. Researchers typically monitor population abundance through regular biodiversity surveys. Researchers can count and identify specimens in the field, or collect specimens and bring them back to the lab, where they are carefully sorted, identified, catalogued, and quantified. Biodiversity surveys are an invaluable source of data and information, but can be time-consuming and labor-intensive. There are specific challenges associated with monitoring insect populations. To start, adult insects are typically only present for a short period of time during the year. Since many insect monitoring activities target the adult stage, it can be difficult to monitor insects within the small window of opportunity in which the adults are present and active. Insect population density fluctuates, and their distributions may change somewhat from year to year. This adds another layer of complexity to insect monitoring efforts. It is difficult to determine insect population health based on low counts in a single year. It could be an artifact of natural population cycles or inaccurate survey timing. Declaration of the conservation status of an insect species relies on accurate monitoring and population estimates. Overestimates of threat status can damage the credibility of ongoing conservation efforts and jeopardize future conservation activities. Yet, conservative estimates of the risk of insect species may obscure the true threats faced by these organisms. In response to the challenges associated with insect monitoring, there has been a shift in species inventory and monitoring approaches that taps into a previously underappreciated resource, the general public. Conservation research can include information provided by citizen scientists, members of the public who are not professionals, but who are knowledgeable and have a passion for science, and in this case, insect conservation. This collaborative approach between members of the public and professional scientists 
serves to educate the public on scientific processes and forms relationships between citizens and scientific research. A good example of citizen science is the butterfly counts that have occurred regularly in North America and Europe since the mid-1970s. At these events, butterfly enthusiasts head outdoors to monitor populations of butterflies in the area. The results of these counts can be used to evaluate species composition and the health of the environment. In the city of Edmonton, entomologist John Acorn patrols the river valley every week during the summer months, systematically monitoring butterfly populations. Let's hear from John about this monitoring project. I'm John Acorn and I teach in the Department of uh, Renewable Resources here at the University of Alberta. What, what we monitor is the entire butterfly fauna. So most of those are native species and we've, we've found about 45 species in total, but there are also a couple of introduced species uh, the, the cabbage white from Europe and the European skipper, obviously also from Europe originally. And then there are also some species that have naturally uh, expanded their ranges into this area. So it's a, it's a nice composite fauna. I've been doing this particular survey for 20 years now. Now I missed a few years early on but 20, 20 years. Before that, what we used to do were, was one day butterfly counts for a, you know, a, a general audience, just to promote appreciation of butterflies. And then we realized, no, if you want to monitor the populations, you can't just go out one day a year because you know, some years the season is more advanced and some it's not. So a weekly count is the way to do it. And then you can really track the, the, uh, the numbers over time. Well, the, the, uh, the primary goal is, is to look for uh, overall trends. You know, are we, are, do we have more butterflies, fewer butterflies? And also to, uh, to follow what's happening with individual species. Often I, I'll get inquiries from the media or, or uh, people on the trail here What's happening with the butterflies? There used to be so many butterflies when I was young. And I'm able to say, you know what? I've got the best data set for butterflies anywhere around Edmonton, probably in Alberta. Uh, and I can tell you that they, they fluctuate, but overall the numbers seem to be stable. On our Pollard walk here in Edmonton, I, I don't have to collect specimens because I know the species well. Butterflies are like birds, you know, there are good field guides. In fact, I've written field guides myself um, and, and they're relatively easy to identify. So we sometimes catch them uh, and release them unharmed and to identify them that way. Um, but for this count, we don't collect specimens. However, I should say that specimen collecting can be extremely valuable, especially in instances where, where you don't have uh, a clear idea of what species or subspecies you're dealing with. Well, I would say that insect collecting actually informs conservation efforts. A lot of people would, would uh, you know, imagine that there's a, a conflict between collecting on the one hand and conservation on the other hand, but it's not the case. Oftentimes, in order to, to, uh, to carry out conservation efforts, you need to have the information, and if the only way to get the information is to collect, then you need that. Uh, you need that. Yes, we often find um, interesting, unusual, unexpected uh, butterflies. Now, any ecological study that, you know, goes on long enough is going to find rare species. But um, just thinking about the, the Pollard Walk here in Edmonton, we occasionally um, have migrant species, for example. And the most uh, abundant migrants here have been the Painted Lady and the Red Admiral. And most years, like this year, zero. 
uh, occasionally they build up in numbers uh, to the south of us uh, in, the, in the United States or even in Mexico and they come north in this huge wave and all of a sudden we're surrounded by these, uh, these migrant butterflies. Uh, monarchs, everyone's curious about monarchs, one year only. One year, 2012 we had eh, half a dozen monarchs on our count. It's a rare butterfly here in Edmonton, but that's another example of a migrant species. My favorite insect? Well, let, let me start by saying I think any insect can be really interesting. The more you learn about them, the more you realize that there's, there's fascination in, in just about anything. But it helps to be inspired by the aesthetics of the, of the insects that you study. So I've had great times, you know, studying butterflies, dragonflies, damselflies, ladybirds, all, you know, beautiful creatures. But I think my all-time favorite is probably the tiger beetles. Tiger beetles, they've, many of them have brilliant colors, and even those that don't have nice patterns, and even those that don't, have an attractive form. They have big eyes, big jaws, they're very active, they're dramatic, they're fun to watch, and, uh, and there's just so much to be learned about tiger beetles. Advances in internet and smartphone technologies have further contributed to the rise of citizen science. Now, instead of waiting for organized species count events, members of the public can easily report insect counts by logging on to websites or insect monitoring apps. Many organizations like eButterfly allow citizens to register insect sightings and locations so that this information can be used by enthusiasts and scientists alike for purposes such as conservation biology. One well-organized citizen science venture is the International Monarch Monitoring Blitz organized by the Mission Monarch Insectarium in Montreal. Their approach encourages members of the public to help monitor migratory monarch butterfly populations. Participants find a patch of milkweed, the host plant of monarch butterflies, and count the numbers of monarch eggs, caterpillars, pupae, and butterflies, as well as the number of stems examined. This information is reported with the location to the Mission Monarch website. This standardized survey technique can be done by anyone and provides valuable information about monarch butterfly and milkweed distributions across their summer range. Citizen science programs like this are an economical way to collect data over vast geographic areas. While citizen science contributes to insect conservation efforts, the approach is not without limitations. Species records provided by citizen scientists often have taxonomic or geographical biases. For example, people are more likely to notice and report insects that are active in the daytime compared to nocturnal species. Similarly, data collection may be skewed by location accessibility. Another challenge associated with citizen science projects is that it is assumed that the insect identifications reported by citizen scientists are accurate. While the production and distribution of user-friendly taxonomic keys for non-entomologists can arm citizen scientists with the relevant tools needed for accurate species identification, insect identification can be difficult, even for professional entomologists. Closely related species can almost be morphologically indistinguishable, while other insects can have multiple phenotypes, which may appear to be different species. Other insects can mimic different species, so that they look alike even if they belong to entirely different groups. Take for example the bumblebee moth. This moth has similar coloration and flight patterns to those of bumblebees. People who are unfamiliar with this mimicry may misidentify the insect. Insect species identification becomes even trickier with closely related species that resemble each other morphologically. For this reason, citizen science projects work best for species with clear identification features. Another challenge to insect identification by citizen scientists is that individual insect species can exhibit polymorphisms. Some highly polymorphic insects can be mistaken for several distinct species. The Asian ladybird beetle has morphs that look very different from each other, but all of them belong to the same species. 
Sexual dimorphism in insects can also confound species identification. This occurs when males and females of the same species differ in appearance, such as the presence of horns on male rhinoceros beetles, the iridescent wings on male brimstone butterflies, and different wing patterns between male and female orange tip butterflies. Sexual dimorphism is so strong in some species that males and females may not even be recognized as the same species for many years. This occurred with trilobite beetles, which have pathogenic females, but males which complete normal development to an adult beetle. Males and females of the same species can not only look different from each other, but sometimes have different ecological roles. Mosquitoes are a great example of this. While female mosquitoes are pests that feed mostly on vertebrate blood, male mosquitoes are actually pollinators of many plant species. Many insects also exhibit developmental polymorphisms, where different forms of the individuals exist depending on the insect's age. As we know from our lessons on insect development, juvenile insects are often morphologically, ecologically, and functionally different from the adult stage. It may be difficult to associate a juvenile insect with its adult counterpart without an in-depth knowledge of the species. Insect communities depend on landscape heterogeneity. At the same time, insect diversity contributes to the composition of flora and fauna across a landscape. Insect conservation, therefore, involves preservation of entire ecosystems rather than individual species. Habitat loss is a powerful driver of insect decline. It is therefore intuitive that insect conservation should involve habitat conservation. There are many ways to achieve this, but one of the main approaches is through the establishment of parks and reserves. Parks and reserves are sections of land in which there is minimal human interference. As a result, these areas help preserve biodiversity and natural ecosystem processes. Preservation of ecosystems within these reserves can maximize the sustainability of healthy insect populations. Parks and reserves are often central components to many conservation efforts. For maximum effect, habitat preservation must ensure landscape heterogeneity with a variety of habitats. This is because different species have different habitat requirements. Conditions that work for one species may not be tolerated by another. Through the conservation of a variety of habitats, a broad diversity of insect species can be supported. Insects can access different habitats even in fragmented landscapes because most can disperse by flight. Dispersal events can be less risky if managed habitats connect populations and reduce risks of local extinction. Linear strips of habitats such as hedgerows or closely spaced networks of small habitat patches can serve as corridors for insect movement. These principles of insect conservation can also be applied on a smaller scale within urban environments. Insect diversity usually declines toward the center of a city. The presence of parks, private gardens, and ponds scattered across a large metropolis can sometimes provide refugia for insects, especially if these habitats are linked. These patches of semi-natural habitat help to lessen the impact of urbanization on insect assemblages, especially if the green areas are composed of native vegetation. Locally, the University of Alberta sits along the edge of Edmonton's North Saskatchewan River Valley Park System, an 18,000 hectare ribbon of green that runs through the city. It is the largest urban park in Canada and is made up of at least 20 smaller parks and over 160 kilometers of trails. This river valley habitat is impressively rich in both terrestrial and aquatic insect diversity and is a preferred outdoor classroom for many entomology professors at the University of Alberta. It can be more challenging to conserve endangered insects than vertebrates, in part due to the overall negative perception that the general public has of insects. 
Conservation efforts are often geared toward animals that appeal to us in some way, and usually involve charismatic megafauna, such as pandas, eagles, and rhinos. Unfortunately, many people have an ingrained negative perception of insects. They often think that insects are pests, like cockroaches, mosquitoes, or fleas. Aside from butterflies and sometimes bees, few insects are considered pretty or charming. This is why butterflies, with their aesthetic appeal, are often iconic symbols of insect conservation. They are one of the few groups of insects that attract interest for funding for conservation purposes. It is often a challenge to convince the public that conservation of other insects is also important. For instance, the giant weta from New Zealand, along with other wetas, is at risk of extinction due to the combined effects of invasive species and habitat loss. These omnivorous insects fill a similar ecological role to small mammals and help in seed dispersal for plants with fleshy fruit. Giant wetas are the largest insects in the world by mass and were among the first inhabitants of Madagascar when the island broke off from the mainland. The large and potentially frightening appearance of the giant weta makes them less well-liked than most insects at risk, like butterflies or bees. This makes it difficult to drum up public support for giant weta conservation, despite the many important ecological services they provide. In many cases, public relations campaigns are needed to change people's perceptions of insects. Most insect conservation efforts target large charismatic insect species, like butterflies, dragonflies, and bees. These species are most likely to elicit public favor and garner public sympathy because of their morphology and easily recognizable ecosystem roles. Public outreach and education is a critical component for local conservation efforts. Facilities like butterfly houses or insectariums are a great way to reach out to the public as they provide strong positive experiences for the visiting public and reinforce individual appreciation for the beauty of butterflies and other insects. When a specific species is used in conservation efforts to evoke public reaction, it is referred to as a flagship species. Conservation of the habitat of a flagship species may help other nondescript insect species that live in the same region. This is called the umbrella effect, in which other insect species are conserved by default as a result of the conservation of the target species. The Queen Alexandra's birdwing butterfly of Papua New Guinea is an example of a flagship species and a conservation success story. It is the largest living butterfly species in the world, and conservation efforts focused on this butterfly have saved other local species due to the umbrella effect. Unfortunately, large-scale logging activities are once more threatening the rainforests these butterflies call home. We spoke with the curator at the Royal Alberta Museum Bug Gallery, Peter Hewley, about his thoughts on the importance of insects. You, you know, I love all animals. I've always found them very, very interesting. And I think it's just that they're more abundant than everything else. If you were to, to put them species numbers side by side, I mean, we're so hopelessly outnumbered by the insects that it is really odd to think that people don't really have a, a healthy attitude towards them. So, uh, you know, growing up here in Edmonton, in the city, in the backyard, I, I flipped over rocks and dug through the garden and you wouldn't find elk and cougars that way. You'd find slugs and centipedes. So they were a much more um, accessible group of organisms. Um, and of course, as far as the diversity is concerned. If you love animals, well, there are more than a million kinds of these. Like everything else put together doesn't even come close. So, um, you know, it's not a matter of, of not appreciating vertebrates or not appreciating mammals and birds. It's that they're all really important and there's just so much more of the invertebrates than everybody else put together. It's that the 97% the of the animal kingdom that we typically just dismiss. 
Excellent question. We have such a wide range of species here. We're probably at the better part of 250 species. And once we're up to full bore, once my saltwater tanks are a little bit more established and we can start to populate them further with other sorts of invertebrates, we might be up to 300 species. So it's a, a lot of different mouths to feed. Um, and so it depends on where they're coming from. So things like our uh, northern crayfish and our tiger beetles that are native species here in the province, we actually go out and collect those. We need to have special permits to collect the northern crayfish because they're a native yet invasive species. Uh, otherwise, for tiger beetles, it's if you happen to be in a, in a provincial park, we need to have a special permit to catch them. But generally, there are no laws protecting invertebrates in Canada unless they are endangered or they're in a protected space. Um, for the exotics, it kind of it's a range. So in some cases, we'll actually get them from suppliers in the countries where they're from. Uh, so we have suppliers in Malaysia, in Arizona, in Taiwan. Um, I even end up going to Germany and even other places in Canada to, to obtain things. So it sort of depends on what's available. Ideally, we try to get capital captive bred specimens wherever possible. Um, and so that's where if I get my giant African millipedes from a fellow in the UK, hopefully he's actually breeding them there as opposed to just shipping them straight out of Africa. So generally a lot more captive bred stuff has become available, but because it's an exotic, especially one that is a herbivore, uh, we have to have special import permits in order to do that. So through the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, they, it's through their Plant Health and Biosecurity Directorate that we have to apply for permits to bring them in. And they're concerned that we might be bringing something in that could attack our forests or attack our crops. These are large exotic animals that probably would not survive our winters. So it's less of a concern. So we have a particular containment level that we shoot for, which is actually display. Uh, if you were running a laboratory that was working on, say, Dutch elm disease or a virus or something like that, you'd have to have much tighter protocols to make sure that that stuff is contained. But that is that sort of regulatory framework within which we have to apply for those things. So bringing them into Canada is very much regulated. Once they're in Canada, we actually trade with other institutions like the Montreal Insectarium, wherever possible. And that's a, a really handy thing, too, because instead of importing things from the wild or even importing things from captive breeders uh, you know, abroad, I can just trade with the insectarium. I have lots of millipedes. What do you guys have extras of? Let's trade. Um, we've been doing the same thing with our coral, actually. We've been able to trade coral specimens with a hobbyist locally and triple the number of species of coral we have in our displays without taking anything out of the ocean. Um, it may be that we're at a point now where as some of these countries start to tighten up their own regulations and their own laws relating to export of wildlife, that we're now going to have to, just by virtue of, of necessity, have to start relying on captive breeding. And I think that's an excellent thing. I think it's, a, it's, it's high time that some of the less sustainable practices that we've been going for years are finally curbed in, the, in favor of, of what can be easily kept in captivity. So if, if I can trade in coral that we have extra of and the shops in town can say locally grown, uh, that's a lot better than stuff that's being pulled from Indonesia and other sorts of places. So I think there's, it's, I've seen a vast improvement over the years and wherever possible, we try to make sure that it's, it has as minimal of a footprint as possible. Um, also with the Malaysian suppliers that are bringing stuff in from the wild, they actually own a chunk of jungle and they turn a profit by bringing, by selling insects from that. Now you could see that potentially that could be unsustainable, but if that jungle is making you more money producing insects than it would being cut down and turned into a coffee grove or something like that, or palm oil or something, this is, it's far better. And these guys have been in business for decades um, and supported by a giant butterfly farm and some captive breeding and that sort of stuff. So there are certainly, um, you know, scrupulous, reliable breeders and suppliers out there. And we do our absolute best to make sure that that's who we're bringing them from. And they also have to be approved through that Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So, so we're pretty careful where we get those guys and try to breed them here as much as possible so we don't need to be bringing them in from elsewhere. Insect conservation is complex, and there are many factors that must be considered for each species in question, its habitat requirements, and the ecosystem overall. Implementation of conservation and species management programs often requires extensive research and assessment. Effective communication among researchers, managers, policymakers, regulatory authorities, and members of the public is also essential. There are challenges associated with insect conservation, such as the identification of species and in the public's overall perception of insects. Education and outreach are pillars of conservation that help address these challenges and can be used to educate members of the public about the importance of insects in our lives.